So my dear friends, my, um, my colleague and co-founder of ICS, uh, Karen Linkwish, she gave an article to read, uh, something probably you know, you've probably read yourself, where Pope Francis talks about how critical it is in this century to let go of the throwaway culture. Those we marginalize, the ones who are outside our tribe, the, the, the poor, the, the, the immigrant, the refugee, and really engage in the culture of encounter. Think about it. This is what is critically needed for us. If you really want to foster an era of peace, of togetherness, of higher understanding, am I engage, engaging in a culture of encounter, to have the grace, the courage to go outside my tribe and connect in a human way with the other, the, one, the ones I disregard. So I thought I would start by asking myself, what is the culture of encounter with religions? This is a house of worship, interfaith community sanctuary. And the moment we come across the diversity of religions, we come up with this terrible problem, difficult problem, overarching problem, the problem of exclusivity. Chosen people, the only way, my book is superior, You know, before COVID, I used to really enjoy going to speak in uh, schools. Sometimes elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. And once the topic was about religion, and this one person, I can't remember, one kid, young, young boy, I forget, during the presentation or after, uh, he was saying, wouldn't you say that this um, issue of exclusivity is actually a mental health issue. I said, what do you mean? Uh, he said, well, you know, it's, 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 it's like a form of hallucination. Another person, it was a girl who said, isn't this exclusivity a form of racism? You can't go to heaven because of the color of your belief. Isn't it a spiritual racism? You know, those beautiful insights by these innocent children really splashed in my chest. And it was true, it is true. So uh, I love to try to understand this exclusivity and, and yet not be judgmental. Some of you might be familiar with this book, The Gift by Hafiz. There's a wonderful poem, uh, I don't know it by heart, but it symbolizes what is this exclusivity. It's called lousy at math. Once a group of thieves stole a large diamond, larger than a goose egg. Its value could have easily bought 1,000 horses and 2,000 acres of the most fertile land in Shiraz, that's in Persia. But the thieves got drunk that night to celebrate this great hall. But during the course of the evening, the effects of the liquor and their mistrust of each other grew to such an extent that they decided to divide the stone into pieces. To divide the stone into pieces. 
of course, then the priceless became lust. Most everyone is lousy at math and does that to God. Dissects, dissects the indivisible one by thinking, saying, uh, this is my beloved. Uh, he looks like this and acts like that. Uh, how could that moron over there really be God? And then, of course, there are the sages with this higher consciousness. Where we, we all need to be like that eighth century beloved female sage Rabia, who exclaimed that in my soul, there is a mosque, there's a church, there's a temple where I kneel and everything dissolves in God. Or Ibn Arabi, that wonderful Sufi sage who says, my heart, my heart is capable of every form. It is a pasture for the gazelles. It is a temple of the idols, a convent for the Christian, the tablet of the Torah, the book of the Quran. My religion is love. Wherever the love camel goes, that's So just be with this, that we need to overcome this curse of exclusivity through the, the culture of engagement, of encountering the other in a loving, compassionate way. Am I doing that? Are you doing that? You know, let's take the culture of encounter to really face and look at our scriptures, our holy books. You know, when I work with uh, Rabbi Ted and Pastor Don McKenzie, we talk about those beautiful teachings of, in our traditions of oneness, of unconditional love, of compassion, justice but do our revelations conform to those beautiful teachings beautiful values beautiful principles that's why we say every holy book has two kinds of verses particular and universal there's something i like to repeat again and again uh, for my own sake that these there are these two kinds of verses let's be aware particular verses are in desperate need desperate need of historical and textual context. Universal verses are timeless, placeless, filled with wisdom. The problem is when I take a particular verse and I advocate, preach that as a universal verse. Or to exalt my religion, I will take a particular verse from another religion and compare that to universal religion, uh, universal verse in my religion. That's why I love that wonderful saying by Rumi who says, a bee and a wasp, a bee and a wasp, they drink from the same flower. One produces nectar, the other one produces a sting. Same flower, because it depends. Our understanding, our comprehension, our interpretation depends on our level of consciousness and our intention. And both of these can be really shaped in a positive, loving, compassionate, meaningful way through the culture of encounter with the other. You know, there's a wonderful lady in, in Pakistan, a Canadian. She's like an influencer. She has this Instagram and Facebook. 
uh, Rosie Gabrielle. And she is very disturbed by the mistreatment and the cruelty meted out to dogs because of a false hadith. Hadith means saying of the Prophet Muhammad that dogs are unclean. And so dogs are mistreated. Now it has been shown that this is, it has been proven beyond doubt, this is a false saying. This is a pre-Arab custom, a pre-Arab saying. But still, it takes time for traditions to slowly, slowly dissolve. So Rosie Gabriel, you might want to check her out. She uses uh, verses from the Quran and the other authentic hadith to show how we need to encounter our prejudices to overcome these biases. Now, it is very critical, uh, as I've talked about engaging in this culture of encounter with our religion, with our scriptures, to really do it with compassion, with mercy, with decency, with good manners, but most of all, with genuine humility. And mark my words, genuine humility. You know, Cindy, the same story is in all the three monotheistic traditions. Let me take the Jewish uh, version of it. There's a rabbi who enters a synagogue and, uh, and prays there and reads the Torah and is so touched, so moved by the presence of God that, you know, he starts rolling on the ground saying, uh, you know, exclaiming, I am nothing, I am nothing, I am nothing, I am nothing. He cries out, I am nothing. And he rolls on the, on the floor and he's crying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Uh, so in comes the cantor and he's so touched by the scene. He also begins to roll on the floor. I am nothing, oh God, I am nothing, I am nothing. And now comes the janitor who is also so touched. He gets on the floor, you're crying out, I am nothing, I am nothing. And then what does the rabbi do who nudges the cantor and says, huh, huh look at that. Look at who thinks he is nothing. So just be with that story. Genuine humility. So now, about overcoming exclusivity, celebrating diversity, what can we do? Mahatma Gandhi advised that it is the sacred duty of every individual to have an appreciative understanding of other traditions, other religions. Don't say, I am non-prejudiced, I'm open-minded. As I keep on saying in, in, in my sermons, Gandhi would say, what are you open-minded about? You must have knowledge and appreciative understanding of the other religions. You know, uh, I love to tell people that if you're rooted in one tradition, that's your major, as per the American concept of education, that's my major. Also, please adopt a minor. You know, people in colleges have majors and minors. So my major actually in my life is Islam, but my minor is Buddhism. And I tell them, try it. And you'll find that this deepens and waters your roots in your own tradition. Many other things, but most important, if I go with the culture of encounter, take a risk and meet the other who's different, who disagrees with you. You see, in our interfaith work, we realize we've always been singing to the choir. It could be in hundreds or thousands, but it's people who usually agree with us. If you really want to create change, like the Pope says, go out and meet the other at their place. So once I and Ted and Don, we uh, decided to do this. Uh, I think Don couldn't come that day. That's a Christian pastor. So I and Ted went to this huge mega church 
when they have services, they have over 5,000 people. And we sat down and we listened to the uh, sermon and the pastor was a very conservative and evangelical believes in this is the only way uh, he began to speak and he said you know if you meet a teenage unwed girl and she gets pregnant don't criticize her be like jesus help her if somebody has aids don't criticize be like jesus help that person reach out be of service you know it was so good that ted my rabbi friend he nudged me and he said jamal this is so good this is disappointing as if almost on cue the next sentence that came out of the pastor was but if you want to be filled with hate bitterness anger be a muslim be a muslim be a muslim be a muslim and of course you know our group was very aghast but i, I was very excited why because i would have a chance to talk to this person so when we you know it was a uh, arranged meeting so we met the pastor and i told him uh reverend you know in islam jesus is highly honored but as a prophet and jesus would never have said this thing what you have said he ignored me i said it a second time He kind of looked at me, you know, didn't say anything. I said it a third time. He said, Jamal, uh, why are you so worried? Next time I'll pick on some other people. I said, no, no, that's not the point, you know, that Jesus would never have said this. And that's Christianity. But you know what that did, that encounter? It gave us the opportunity to talk, to engage. And we decided to meet again. And we talked about, well, let's, we can't agree on certain things. And by the way, he said, you know, I'm not as radical as my congregants are. But I sometimes speak like that because he has to cater to their views. Anyhow, we agreed on a service project. This conversation, this dialogue, this interchange of ideas, it led to, okay, let's work on Habitat for Humanity. A lot of this these very conservative congregants are helping to build homes for the poor it so happened as said we said let's join this particular one and they're building home for a muslim for a, for, for, for a poor muslim family and he said he had no objection no objection at all and in the course of that some of the congregants from his group their their hearts began to open up it came through encounter that's one story. The other story is I knew of two very conservative, angry Christians who were allergic to Islam. So I made it a point to get to know them on a human level, connected with them, encountered them in a loving, compassionate, human way, sharing stories. They were very suspicious, took about a year maybe more, if I, if I remember. They lost their allergy about Islam, but that's not the real story. When I got together with them and met their families and communities, I began to realize there is so much sweetness in their community. But more than that, there is such a commitment in this very conservative, exclusive group to social justice issues. My understanding, my prejudice, my stereotyping of conservative Christians, that begin, began to expand and change. So the real story is, I got changed. So just, just be with that for a few moments. So now when Pope Francis talks about the throwaway culture, the poor, the marginalized, the war refugee, 
the refugee who wants to cross across the border. You know, I will never be able to understand their pain, their anguish. I can have empathy, but if I say I understand your pain, that's not true. So what can I do? In my own life, what I do is I, I ask myself, uh, Jamal, it's sort of a self audit. How do you treat those who offer you no material advantage? Jamal, how do you treat those over whom you have power? I remember the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad who says that, you know, if you see injustice, oppression, use your hands, do something, get engaged. If you cannot do that, use your mouth, speak out. If you cannot do that, then at least pray from your heart. But remember, in this instance, is the weakest form of faith. One last thing I do, and I talk about this all the time, is when I, when there are people suffering, and I know I, I can never really empathize deeply because I can never really connect to their authentic pain and anguish. I always remember this story in the Islamic tradition in the Quran, and I've said this many times, before God sent down unborn humanity down to earth, God gathered everybody and said, am I not your sustainer? And we got so excited, yes, yes, you are a sustainer. And then, this is not in the Quran, but in the, in the legend as it were, God takes us to a huge cosmic tree and the big branches and on the branches are packages of different sizes, small, medium, large, and God says, I'm sending you to earth. It's a world of duality. These are packages of suffering. There'll be joy. There'll also be suffering. Before you go down, take a package. And then the nobler ones among us, they chose to take the larger packages. So when I see people suffering, and I know I can really never really fully empathize. In my own way, I ask myself, how can I be of service authentically? And with a sense of, and it's very important for me, with a sense of deep, deep gratitude. My friends, there are many people in our lives, in the throwaway culture, in our own extended family, people who are lonely, frustrated, angry, depressed. You can do something in your own extended family, in your community. They might be mean, they might be unfriendly, they might be aggressive. But all the great sages say, please understand one thing, they are suffering. They are suffering. So I, 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 again, I, I got out the same, the same book. There's a, a passage about the fact that, do you understand these people who are mean, who are unfriendly, who are aggressive, they are suffering. This is called a, a cushion for your head. Addressing those people. Just sit there right now. Don't do a thing, just rest. For your separation from God, from love, for your separation from God, from love is the hardest work in this world. Let me bring you trays of food and something you'd like to drink you can use my soft words as a cushion for your head. 
the point here is, as the Quran says, that because of this constant fear, anger, sadness, pain, the Quran says it's not that their eyes have become blind, their hearts have become blind. And how do you open those hearts? Reason can help, logic can help, not very much. Use force, it'll be counterproductive. We have to create the environment of compassion, of love, of connection. They're craving a connection, a relationship. I love that Harvard study, the longest Harvard study on happiness, followed by many other studies. And amazingly, they all show that the number one determinant of happiness is not money, is not social status, it's not your diet. It's relationships, having relationships. They don't have to be perfect, but you have relationships that are reliable. There's a connection. And shockingly, the number two reason, the determinant for happiness was, again, relationship. But how do you relate to people you meet casually? The bank teller, the clerk at the grocery store, the ones you meet casually, how do you treat them? It has, an, it has an incredible impact. My friends, I'm looking at the time, uh, I'll, I'll, I, and I think I'll bring it to a close. It's critical that also, if I want to engage in the culture of encounter with compassion, with understanding, with love, I have to do the inner inconvenient work of being compassionate, loving with myself, of connecting with myself. You know, this is reminding me of my friend, late friend. Some of you, some of you might, might know uh, Robbie, who passed away. Reverend Robbie was a pastor here, but he, he, used to, he used to do the course in miracles, was a very popular teacher. And he would say, the main thing you need to do is be at peace within yourself. And that by itself will create peace around you. But are you at peace? And he gave examples in his talks that he was not at peace because he remembered when he was a young man, he used to work in a bank and he used to collect money from one particular huge national company that had parking lots. And he had, his job was to count the money, but he would steal a part of the money because there was so much money they wouldn't notice. And how would they notice? He's the one counting. And so over the years, he stole money. And he had this guilt. He wouldn't want to be compassionate with himself or connect with himself. And so one day he said, let me overcome this guilt. Let me do this work. Let me ask for forgiveness. So he calculated the amount of money he had stolen, wrote a check, and wrote a letter apologizing to the CEO of that national company. And that gave him so much peace. And he said people around him felt peaceful. And he said the CEO told him that when he read that letter, he was so touched that he began this process of forgiveness for himself. He talked about this letter to his employees who duplicated the same practice of doing this inner inconvenient work. So what can you do to be at peace? Two quick points uh, in two minutes. It is critical to really build community. Have a circle of love. People can be very small, two, three, four people you love, you trust. There's an aspiration for truth. And Prophet Muhammad said, you need this circle of love because these are the people who can help you 
mature into a more developed human being. So the famous saying of Prophet Muhammad, who said, your spiritual practices are only as good as those of your closest friends. Your spiritual practices, Jamal, are only as good as those of your closest friends. So choose your friends wisely. And then in this group, do service projects where you interact with others. You encounter others. And the other last thing I wanted to say is, may we all spend more time in nature. It is so healing. I was listening to NPR a couple of days ago. There was a program about how the chirping of birds and listening to the chirping of birds creates happiness. And they did some calculation. They said that if you increase your hearing and seeing birds who are chirping by 10%, it creates happiness at least equal to 10% of increase in your salary. So maybe spend more time ourselves in nature. And I, I just can't end without a story. My, my, one of my most favorite stories is that about a Zen monk about to give a talk, always in nature. And a lot of monks are gathered outside in the, in the forest or park. And he's about to speak. And then suddenly they hear a bird singing, chirping. And they all become very, very quiet. They all listen to the singing, to the chirping of the bird. When the chirping and the singing stops, the monk steps down and says, the sermon has been delivered. It's over. So my friends, my long lecture finally has been over. So I'll be very quiet now. Focus on your nostril. And simply be present with your breath as you inhale and as you exhale, just this much. Okay, letting go of this, still eyes closed. Focusing now on the first ch chakra or the lowest part of your spine, the sacrum area. And now making an intention to send a beautiful cord of divine light flowing from the sacrum area all the way down, way down, deep, deep, deep into mother earth, connecting us to the womb of Mother Earth. Feel that connectedness, bonding, rootedness. Okay, letting go of this now. And now focusing on the crown of the head the crown chakra and making an intention that from the crown of the head, sending a beautiful cord of divine light, any color upwards, way up, higher, higher, piercing those mysterious realms and connecting us to the heart of heaven. Feel that connection, the blessing of that bonding, And letting go of that, 
The last step, focus on your heart. This is the wellspring of light and love of divinity who is outside of you and inside of you in your heart. Focus on your heart. And now from the heart, you make an intention to pour out light and love, pouring out, radiating, gushing out of the heart. See it, feel it, experience it. The more love and light you pour out, the more love and light you become filled up with. It's a law, ancient and inexhaustible. Simply making an intention to pour out light and love from the heart. And the great sages suggest that this is a great practice, both in meditation and also in your waking hours, as often as you can remember to focus on the heart and just send out light and love to trees, to animals, to people, people you don't like. Remember, if it's people you don't like, you're sending it not to their personality, to their souls. Just remembering to send out light and love as often as possible. Do that for just for a few more seconds. I'll do a chant and then open your eyes at the end of the chant. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. 